else does, you know? Right. I mean, something we can talk about, because that's kind of the, that's the arc that you go through, I think. Uh, like, with me, I feel like uh, when I started getting any kind of recognition, I think a big part, I was so, like, socially maladapted that I had a really schizophrenic relationship with a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. People were more successful than me. My kind of, my acceptance in the scene, like, big like combination of chip on my shoulder and kind of like uh yeah like i said social maladaptation so uh yeah i think you see that arc you see cartoonists i've seen it with people you interview where mm -hmm. they'll make references to people they talk shit about early mm -hmm. on yeah, like, yeah i've heard clouds do that in interviews mm -hmm. well it's when you first start doing comics you you know normally you're pretty young and you're very like insecure and you don't know like where your place is like uh you know you know you're really unsure about your identity in comics and stuff like that so uh it's like really competitive almost like you know you want to be better than the next person that's like your age or whatever who's coming up and and so it's friendly but at the same time it's like uh and actually i think it's probably pretty healthy to like see other another artist work and be like ah oh, now i've got to like step it up you know and you started comics kind of late i guess i mean right besides the typical story of like being like a young kid who is drawing comics and then you you stop and become a fine artist yeah something like that yeah i mean but i was i was i mean i dropped out of doing comics i mean my story is that like i was doing comics when i was a kid and then my parents like really made it very um forbidden like literally like i had a list of rules of conduct in the house and at the top of the list was like wasn't allowed to do comics Mm -hmm. So then I was sneaking around doing them a little bit. And then by the time I was 16 or 17, I was like, I can just, you know, I can, I can, um, I can just fuck it. I can do this when I'm, I'm almost out of the house. What are they going to do? And then um, 18, I was still doing it. And I was going to go to SCCA, Columbus College of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, I was like, it's like trying not to think of a white horse. It's like, you know, I think I, I think I talked about this with somebody else on another podcast, like, mm -hmm don't let art school fuck up your comics mm -hmm. and then it's like i know they don't value comics here but um don't don't um you know unlearn it but i did unlearn it mm. and then i was like tw i dropped out of school when i was like 19 and i didn't really start comics again for about 10 years mm. i take stabs at it but i was i was um yeah i, I was was I lost like whatever that weird um, ability is to care about continuity and to care about the craft. I thrown a lot of that out the window and discovering fine art and discovering real slash and burn artists. So when you dropped out of school, what you weren't doing comics at all? Like, or like, cause you had that 10 year period of, of 19 to, I think you went back to school when you were 29, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I may have been 31 actually. The um the yeah, I, I would take stabs at it. And it was just really, you know, it, it was like a big, it was, it was they were big failures. I mean, I'd but but then again, I would find I found stuff that I was doing during that period, and some of it I, I would be I'd um I was doing something with the rapidograph that was a lot like the stuff that I'm doing now. It was like biographical. It was like a story that I haven't told again. And I have like a bunch of pages of it, but halfway through the book, I started having, you know, with, without really knowing about the parameters I should be working within. Like I just started using different paper sizes. Mm -hmm. I started doing in the middle of it. I went from vertical to landscape format oh. and and then you're looking at it and it's really demoralizing because you realize that you've fucked up and then another and thus another cartoonist would know better or another people, person is supposed to do this. So I have a story about how like uh, it's another like sad Josh Bear autobiographical story about like how um, we used to used to get taken to summer camp, day camp with mm -hmm. a bus full of half the kids were going to a another camp for kids with mental disabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, they um, were, uh, is that the right term? Um, you know, men, developmentally disabled. And I, it would, it, it's like a really weird comic about this one kid who would 
like take my entire hand and put it in his mouth. Oh, and, wow. yeah, yeah. And uh, it was like, and he, he could really overpower me. And so it was like, I remember I'd go to school and I'd be like, I'm not going to let this kid push me around. He isn't, you know, he doesn't even go to a, a public school. And then just being like completely weirded out. Anyways, I was doing a comic about that. And uh, anyways, and it was it was pretty much like I'm doing now, but I just didn't, I, I would be able to do it in fits and starts. And that mm -hmm. was probably like, well, I was like 27 or something. I was doing that. How many pages was it? would it have been? I bet it's like 15. I bet I could find it. it it's hard to say. I, I, I remember it was a scat. It was more than I thought it was. And it was better than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And it's definitely something I'll probably return to. But at this point, maybe like when I'm 60. Yeah. And what was your style like back then? Did you always have the same style in general? Yeah, that's a, that's interesting. Because like I said, I was using rapidographs. Yeah. So I, I had a really thick outline. I was using like the fat jumbo one. So oh, yeah. It was a little bit like um, uh, Windsor McKay, mm -hmm. because, you know, not as careful as him, but for me, more of a, <laughs> a careful, a careful comic. Yeah, because he always has his super fat outlines, uh -huh. and, and then beautiful, delicate lines on the inside. What? So, what was your painting style like? Was it similar to your comics? Um, yeah, I was doing. Uh, well, I was trying to do like. Pettibone influenced big images. So they were very, the stuff that I was really kind of getting uh, uh, into, like getting a pretty good, getting some traction with was um, a fusion of text and line with little touches of paints. And I'd erase things and I kind of figured out a different way to do it every time. Mm -hmm. I went, um, I, I still have some, but I, I build shit up and there's a lot of heavy line. And a lot of kind of sometimes I go I use ink and then I go over it with a oil crayon and then I start layering on oil paint around it. Mm -hmm. I was still doing that all the way up until grad school. And I gra I graduated grad school in two thousand and nine, mm -hmm. and I still like that stuff. I have like an unfinished piece on my wall. It was pretty sincere work, uh, and uh, it was always trying not to be derivative of Pettibone or Mike Kelly, but trying to trying to um kind of explore space in between them mm -hmm. and um yeah i i i was uh so i was always super in love with comics though i kind of um yeah i found myself trying to pursue um paint uh uh fine art like all during my 20s because that was kind of how i got back into doing art mm -hmm. and then I was like, at least I'm doing this. But really, my bigger, grander ambition was to do comics. Were they large canvases that you're working on? It was like expensive paper. And then oh. I, I would get these rolls of paper. And then I found out that the paper I was buying, like they had actually done that thing where the manufacturer starts using poor materials. And they oh. and I didn't even know it. It was like, the it's like, I've been using it for like seven years. And the guy who recommended the paper to me, saw it and he was like what is this paper you're using i was like that's what you told me to use and he was like yeah you gotta get some paper better paper yeah i always i have this problem when i go to art stores is like i always buy a bunch of shit that like i'm not going to use but i can't help it like i just get like i, I you know I, I buy that like fancy paper and i'm like man i'm gonna do like some big drawings like and then i just like have it in my flat file and like i never get the time to do it because i don't like create art like i just i i draw comics like that's the only time i'm really drawing is like just to like in the service of telling a story and I don't like create images, you know? And I, but I, when I was younger, I have a very similar story to you. We're like, you grew up on comics because of my brothers got, you know, stopped making uh, comics to try and get into like fine art. Like that's where my passion all of a sudden went. And then I just, but for me, like I just failed miserably. Like I, I just couldn't do it. Like my, I didn't have like a, that, that like special touch like with paint or anything. Like it just looked terrible. And so eventually, like, uh, found myself back going back to comics, you know, and and but even because I was raised on comics like you, my when I tried to do like fine art stuff, it was always narrative. Like I, I just because that's how I knew what art was like to me, art was like, t in the, you know, telling a story in some way. And so all of my uh, like paintings and stuff were like that, like I'd even put words in them. 
what so when you were getting back into comics what was the comics landscape like at the time um you know a big thing that helped me was uh a friend of mine got me a copy of uh I won't, I won't mispronounce her name but e bethea i think it is but it might be bethia hmm. um oh yeah great great and uh somebody got me a copy of that and bobby madness's comics that were in mm -hmm. comet were in comet bus mm -hmm. really had made a big mark on me and i think it was a little bit like i knew that there was i had always been really i kind of I had really been kind of, um, I like that they were so scratchy. I mean, Bobby's not exactly scratchy, but he kind of, it, it's got kind of like a, oh, maybe the way it's presented, it's just in his zine. Mm -hmm. He's not doing a serious graphic novel. He's, do, he's doing his stuff in a stapled zine. You got the sense that he just, you know, he did this stuff like as a side hustle while he was doing a million other things. Mm. And in a way that stuff like made me less intimidated than looking at all the real masters. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what would just make me wither inside as much as I really also was very inspired by it. So early two thousands, I was looking at them. Jeffrey Brown was really oh. inspiring to me. Yeah, me too. And I felt like I had one of the things that stopped me from doing comics was that I had read editorials in TCJ that were like, stop doing autobio before you've really lived and experienced anything. Right. And stop doing superhero shit that you're kind of trying to pretend is like veiled through like layers of irony when really you're just doing superhero shit. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like Big Head, but I liked that he was doing it. And Ron Rage's Spider-Man comic. Oh yeah. I was like, okay, I, I was like, he's not only is he doing superhero stuff, but he's just doing straight on Marvel stuff. And I think there's four things in a lot of ways um, really were I was really kind of using them as heavy reference points when I started making work. Mm -hmm. And then it was easy to just leave uh, like the fine arts world behind and, and get into comics. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the reason that I got into fine art was I have a really close relationship with my oldest brother. And I, it's been in my war, my books, you know, it's kind of like lost and drifting around in Columbus. And he was like, come out to LA, you can live with me. He had just become really successful. And he basically is doing this big brother thing where he was like, don't be a fucking idiot, do some art, you know, like, and he was like, why don't, he's like, you could have a real career. You could like be successful, go, don't fuck around with comics. Like it's a dead end and, you know, do, do painting, do like fine art. You can be like Basquiat. And then, um, so I partially wanted to do it because I wanted to get into art anyways, but I also wanted to do it because he had asked me, me live in his house. And that was basically the main thing he asked for, which is pretty noble. He was yeah. like, he didn't ask me to, you know, to pay him back for flying him out there, flying me out there, like letting me live in his extra room or any of the other things that he did for me. But he, um, so I felt like it was kind of, it was kind of important to me as a bond to him that I do this art. And I did it for about 10 years mm. and I took it as far as I could go. I had uh, a show at, um, I got a show at a gallery in uh, I think Beverly Hills. I started was hustling after, you know, that I was uh, hustling after that career, but kind of late and was, all, was really going about it in a really weird way. Like I would just go into galleries and be like, will you show me like a complete, you know, uh, like in a really naive way. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I went to some like good galleries and talked to the owners, like people that you really oh. should not do that with. And, um, well, how you know, are you supposed, how are you supposed to do it? How do you get a show at a gallery? Me, I'm not sure. I don't think anybody knows. I think everybody you talk to will say it's a cert. I think it's just like, it's a cert circuitous route like you a little bit of being social my friend jeremy i know that he made a point of getting an apartment in new york in the 2000s in, in the 90s and early 2000s so he could be in the center of things it was a part of me i don't think he could afford so it was an investment mm -hmm. and then entertain him and his girlfriend would have nights over where they would start inviting uh gallerists over i think he liked those people but i think it was also uh, his careerism Wow. And was, was it working for him? Is he, is he doing okay? 
<laughs> Jeremy is uh, Jeremy became successful, but then he had like a kind of a, a sort of a breakdown, and mm. he he uh, committed suicide in two thousand seven. Oh and man! I, my next project has actually been a long gestating adaptation of a scre- of a screenplay that he left behind. We actually don't know if it's a screenplay or a novel, but it's a big slab of writing. So Jeremy was uh, Jeremy Blake. He's kind of a public figure. His suicide was a little bit notorious. Um, They like wrote about it in Vanity Fair and then Brett Easton Ellis bought the rights to the article. And then um, I think things had died down. He wanted to kind of produce a film on it. Mm -hmm. It's a really tragic suicide. He was getting very paranoid and um towards the end so anyways i knew him i knew him from before he was when he was still in college he was like best friends with my best friend and i was part of that circle and then he moved to la when i was moving to la and then we hung out a lot Mm -hmm. so then when he and then we kind of when we kind of like uh like weren't really like hey like that much directly in contact I got the sense that I was still kind of like shuffling around on the edge of loserdom and he was you know doing his thing Uh so we didn't really make sense like he could talk to me about hanging out with uh you know like famous successful people and I'd have you know I'd be like I I just got a minimum wage job and (laughs) but then he brought me back into the circle before he was uh, before he committed suicide and I was with him like that summer anyways so I discovered this amazing manuscript that he had um I I saw it when I was helping his mom clean up his apartment and it had always been in the back of my head and now 12 13 years on uh I asked his mom a couple years ago I said you know I've done two major graphic novel long graphic novels I don't know how major they are but uh, I think I'm, I really wanted to adapt the story. And she said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Hmm. So I'm working on that now. You know, well, I was just going to say, this is like becoming like your genre is like illustrating the the life's work of somebody who's no longer here, you know? It's funny, um, Unended. You know, Unended is so good. It like put me in such a weird headspace for the past few days. I, it took me a while to get through it. Um, and man, that was like, it really took me somewhere else. Like that was a... Um, pretty insane i don't think i've ever read a graphic novel like that man like in in your father's portion of it his his actual script is like so swallowed up by your world you know and it's like um the way you've drawn it seems a little different than the other stuff that i've seen of yours like it uh almost uh it's like it's like intestines or something <laughs> it's like it's like somebody is like cut open a bunch of like pigs or something and there's like you're looking at their intestines uh it's like uh man it's like such a visceral experience getting through that thing man so that's a, i don't i yeah that's congratulations on making like such a intense work of art that uh i don't know like it, it gets in your head like i had like weird dreams last night our family situation besides you know my mother didn't pass away but my father was very similar my father like uh considers himself like an artist too like considers himself like a, a writer uh like unappreciated undiscovered writer you know and that's a big like tension i think in a when it comes to like him and i is like i i've been published and he has not been published and i and i think uh uh that becomes kind of a competitive thing between fathers and sons where they they, you know like he doesn't understand why my work would be published i think that's a a a part of it he isn't validated. He doesn't say, of course, I see why this would be published. No, no, no. And I, I think he doesn't like a lot of it. Uh, for like a lot of that's for like religious reasons. He's like very religious. And your father became religious later on, I guess. Yeah. And he was he wasn't like for, we, we were reformed Jews. So he wasn't it was always important to him, but he didn't like exact a lot of the rituals. Hmm like all through my childhood we would go to reform the temple was cool it was one of the best it was one of the best times i got to eat you know yeah. go to friday night services there's like a whole like a whole like um you know banquet table of like brownies and yeah uh, my dad would it's one of the few times he wasn't really he he wouldn't really try to you know um curtail my behavior so i'd always mm-hmm go to the services and I just gorge out and all this food anyways. Um, so yeah, his, it, the, the sense of how the religiousness made him self-righteous and the way that it fucked up his priorities was really, was really there. 
uh, and, and and affected his behavior. And then, yeah, he became more, I think he went back to reading the Torah and shit like that when he got older. What's funny about the play is that I didn't go into it that much in the play, but he really kind of has a self-hating Jew thing going yeah. through it. He, huh. he like anglicized all of our names. Yeah. It's like, you named your kids Daniel, John, John, Sam, Daniel, which are all books of the Bible, I think. And then he, in the script, it's Jesse, Jack, and what was the other name? Henry or something? <laughs> I'm like, what are you, Steinbeck, you know? <laughs> There's other things he cleaned up too. It's it's like that episode of The Office where Jim is doing like um, sim life and he's really into it. And Pam's like, what? Well, it says here that you're like a bicycle mechanic. What's like you have this whole like fantasy that starts to seep into it. So in the in real life, he was a he ran an information uh, uh, what's called the something information center at like the library at OSU. In the script, he's a teacher. You know yeah. the noble the noble teacher profession. I guess it just it didn't really fit. He thought he thought like nobody would understand this mm -hmm. in the play so it's him and he can do whatever he wants but he's got little irish sounding kids running around and he's a, got a job as a teacher and he's complaining that he didn't get tenure to my mom yeah it's i know it's so funny that like he comes in he's just tearing down all the congratulations it was it written like that like father continues to tear down con you know banners of congratulations i thought that's the best part of the script when he um the beginning, the first acts of it are actually pretty well written, and mm -hmm. he's he's making himself look bad, which is what you should you do as a writer. He's still the hero. <clears throat> like I saw Ms. Harkness talk this fall, and she said, "You demonize your heroes and you humanize your villains if you're a good writer." Right, and yeah, it's true. He's doing that. He's kind of kicking himself around a little bit and showing himself warts, warts and all. And I think the way he's clearly being very brusque with my mom. My brother John told me that's based on real stuff. That in fact, the the sign that he tore down in real life was based on a, a real incident that again goes back to religion. Like she got Hanukkah decorations, and he was like, "That's Christmas shit," and he tore them down because it's wow. a sellout. It's a sellout Christmas thing of whitewashing of Jewish uh, religion. I'm like, "Fucking Hanukkah is is whitewashed. It's Christmasized anyways." Yeah. Did uh, you celebrate Christmas growing up or anything? No, oh, no, no. But Hanukkah, yeah. Hanukkah. Yeah, okay. What about you? Like, yeah, Christmas. I mean, you know, I grew up Mormon, so it's all basically Christian. You know, would you? Because I always know from your stories that your family had less money yeah. than mine. I consider us to be lower on the lower end of the middle class spectrum. Oh. You guys are really struggling. Did really you, bad. Yeah. Did you get good presents? Yeah, we had really good Christmases. That's like the one thing from my childhood that I have like all my siblings have like great memories about Christmas. It was a very special time. And my mother told me she would just rack up credit card debt every year in order to make sure that we had a good Christmas. But the rest of the year was just rough. Like, a, you know, she would bounce checks like regularly at like the grocery store and stuff like that just to feed us and everything. Yeah, it was a pretty awful situation. But, you know, I have one kid. And I don't know how anybody could support nine of them. Like it's, it's so, it's really hard, man. It's an expensive uh, thing to do to yourself. But. If there's anything that gives me compassion for my dad, it's the fact that, um, you know, it's a lot easier to do, to do comics and to do your master work, to do your, you know, to do your art practice, your novel, your whatever it is, your painting, if you don't have a family and a job mm, to support. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that's for sure. And you, I, I've heard that you work like on a subway. Uh, I like I like working on the subway a lot, actually. And and the train, I t I take the train to um, New Brunswick, which is like a, it's a twenty minute ride on the subway and then a fifty minute ride on the train. Mm -hmm. And um, it's funny because you can, if you're taking the wrong train, like when you go to DC, it's so bumpy, it's very hard to get work done. So thank yeah. God I'm not working in DC. The New Brunswick train is really smooth. So sometimes I look forward to that because that's a guaranteed two hours that I oh, can, work, you know. That's a great chunk of time. I don't mean to be all over the place with this, but I think about how like, I look at the process for sometimes when I do a page and I know I'm fucking it up. Mm. And sometimes I'll just double down stubbornly. And I'm like, I know I'm <laughs> overworking this. 
I'm just going to keep on working it. And then I'll get really tired and then I'll start slashing away. I'll try to do kind of an expressionistic, you know, a petty bone thing or a flurry of lines like Dale Croy would do or, or, or any other gestural artist, you know, um, Goya. And then, um, and part of me has always been like, if this is bad, it's a general, it's, I'm sorry, it's a genuine measurement of like what I can do and but the, what I what I can do in the time I have with the energy I have with the best um the best of my resources. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I haven't really tried for years to refine like hyena, she has a real systematic way of doing comics. And MS, who's had a big made a big impact to me in this year, just seeing her touring show where she talks about her method and how she breaks it down. See, with her, it's interesting because her content is so raw and punk and a lot of people who talk about continuity are so fucking boring that you don't really give them much credence. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like they, so I've always let myself be really uneven and I've actually between a couple of different things that have influenced me recently, including like doing a, a an interview with another artist, an old school artist who came to my class, who talked to my class recently. And I asked him, what is the process with which you, um, uh, that you, the steps that you do your work in? Because I get asked this a lot by my students. And mm -hmm. I always say, I always give them a, an assortment of, of options. And, uh, you know, that's another thing is that there's a type of comics that you do where they are, a lot of my sketch, the stuff that's in abysmalation, for example, it's real slash and burn. And sometimes that stuff is just as good as a finish, as a nice page. So I have, I've had that kind of schizoid relationship. But anyways, um, it was uh, Bill Ray. He came to talk. He oh, did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. I've always loved his stuff. Mm -hmm. And he talked to my Parsons class on Zoom. And I said to him, so people ask me what the steps are. And I go, so we're looking at one of his, one of his, um, pages of uh what's that black and white kid that he used to do with the flings of hair yeah is it called monroe oh yeah i knew it was yeah. an i don't want to say i didn't want to say i was thinking m but it was monroe and uh i said so well, let's look at the monroe page and he said i said what's the order because i just kind of catch as catch can and he said i'm actually like you left my own devices i'll do a little outline a little rendering a little whatever else and he said but in comics and you probably have a system like this he goes you do um it's line rendering heavy blacks hmm. and i've never had any i either i've never listened to it and i think i've not wanted to know what the smooth streamlined way to do it was so it's a bunch of things i i partially have been like except my work even if it's you know i'm doing it in this really um you know in this really frenzied kind of uh, uh um method i was afraid of it getting too smooth and uh um you're I'll, afraid I'll, of your of your art getting too smooth i don't know i'm like i'm thinking about it i'm wondering what the reasons are that i've avoided trying to learn more mm -hmm. and uh wh wh whatever the reason is i think we have that classic like kind of sense that you don't want to sell out and like make your work too digestible. Like that's mm. just gonna make it different. I don't, I don't know, some of those ideas are really shitty. Some of them are valid. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that your work has like improved every year? Like if you looked at the stuff that you were publishing in, in uh, 2010 or 11 or something, do you think it's a lot different? Yeah, yeah. Like when I look at Feth, the first one that I did, I wasn't, I didn't even finish drawing some of the panel borders. Yeah. And uh, there's sometimes I'll look at stuff and it was better than I thought. I remember looking at, work and being like oh i knew how to draw, ha draw hands huh. earlier than i remember yeah um, right I, i'm waiting you know not not that it's inevitable but i'm waiting for my stuff to get you know to kind of start to get bad like there's some artists that you see that it starts to lose lose some of its punch as they get older mm -hmm. so usually a lot of people that we love they stayed great until the end. Even if they start, some of them got better. Like, I mean, all different levels. Yeah. You know, there's some of the mainstream, there's some of the indie guys that we love that their work just was not as good later on when they made names. Then hmm. there's some of the mainstream people who got terrible. And then there's some of the in-between people who it's like the, some of the people who are like 15, 20 years older than me, who are like, 
they they don't seem to they under they were introduced to Photoshop late in the game after they did years of black and white comics, <laughs> 2080. And I'm like, you don't know that that aesthetically looks bad. What you're doing, you don't know yeah. that lighting looks terrible. Yeah, they don't. Well, they're not designers. That's another thing. Like you don't have a sense of that. So you'll get a lot of there's a lot of like fanographics books that are like collections of like underground comics. You know, like the like the Spain books for for example. I love Spain, but like when he was left to design his own books awful it looks awful and you know a lot of those people they because they're just they're storytellers they're not they don't really have a sense for that kind of thing so i have one of his called like cruising with the hound and it's a collection of his short stories that are autobiographical but the cover is fucking it's so terrible mm -hmm. um and i think that's you know if you're working with someone like fanographics like they have some of the best designers working for them so just send them a file of your pages um because i'll mess it up i'm you know i'm i'm from that same school like i I just want to tell a, a story. I'm not good at images at all, you know? And I have like days where I'm like, I have like an intense need to draw, right? Like, I'm just like, God damn, I have like all this energy built up, but I don't have anything written. So like, it's like the most frustrating thing. I'm just like, fuck, like I'll, I'll like, you know, rule out a, a six panel grid and I'll be like, I'm just going to, maybe I can come up with something that's like really funny. Cause I just have to get this energy out and I, I can't, or like, you know, like I, I have things that I'm working on, but I just, I'm like, I don't want to, I need to take a break from that, but I still want to get this energy out, but I, I have nothing else going on. I have, yeah, I'm I, have, I have ongoing project. I hope that doesn't, I have a, I have to take a step aside from the project I'm doing, like the Jeremy adaptation, because I have to do a piece for an anthology soon, like maybe mm -hmm. over the winter. And I've been wondering how to do it. And I have some notes on it. I actually want to do something about, being haunted by 90s cartoonists and, <laughs> nice and I, I think it's interesting how like now all of a sudden everybody knows joe matt's name mm -hmm. but all the people who have died that only a couple of weirdos know like like um michael dugan oh yeah ted stern um uh gary shamray you know mm -hmm. yeah. and and I, like i said before i have this weird kind of like weird kind of system where sometimes the real mega the real mega greats of people in the canon sometimes i almost don't want to look at them and i want to look at people on the margins more mm -hmm. i've also found that you can kind of figure out how people not that any of those people are hacks they're amazing but you can figure out how the hacks are doing their system more than you can figure out how the really refined people are doing their system yeah do you like uh gary lieb he'd be another one who passed away recently terrible yeah. great idiot land i mean that was a great comic series yeah they we've lost a lot of them in just the past few years it's ridiculous um when, when you so when i think when most people in, in alternative comics kind of uh started to like hear your name and, and get to know who you were was from uh like retrofit the whole oh, yeah. like retrofit thing that happened and how did you uh i remember when that happened i was also a part of that first wave of retrofit and box was like sending out invitations to artists. Do you remember like how you met Box and how you kind of came to be a part of that Philly Philly scene? So I was at SVA. I went, I went to, to New York after uh, in 2005 and I was as a sophomore and I was, um, Box was in comic book, like a comic book, I think it's called Comic Book Hot House, which is like a, a crash course in comic in, in, hmm. intense and intensive and tom hart was teaching it and i begged tom hart to let me be a ta and he's like yeah sure <laughs> he's <laughs> like they, we don't have a tas here at sva but you can be my ta and so box was in that class and who else i feel like sarah glidden was coming in in and out and i'm probably drawing a blank but i think there's some other people went on did some you know, continued that were our significant artists who are in that group. That, that was in New York City. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he, wow. was, he was he was living in Jersey then. I think he was taking the train from Jersey to go. Oh, okay. So, so I met him there, and then we stayed in contact. And he was doing Bellin, and um, yeah, it's like me and him and Pat Alicio were really tight. And uh, he reached out to he reached out to us, and I like jumped at the chance. Mm -hmm. like, trying to remember. In fact. Anytime anybody would invite me to do something, I would use it as an excuse to do something like, you know, to, to do something really big. So Tom Hart had invited me to do, he was going to do a fundraising 
like zine anthology for um to to fund saw when it was just starting he's moving from new york to florida mm -hmm. and he's like yeah i want to have a bunch of cartoonists do cover comics like ron ray j's uh spider-man thing is what i thought so mm -hmm. that's what i did wrong and that anthology never came through but having having somebody invite me you know as an artist it's like you'll take any kind of anything to make to 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 uh, give you a deadline yes and yeah. you know, your, wor your work is legitimate and so i worked on that for like a few months and you know the and i just self-published it so that was like the first thing i did and then i did i did theft i think no i did raw power i did raw power yeah raw power and raw power i think it was like the first because the thing about retrofit was box was like these are the dimensions i think your comic needs to be 32 pages long you know, and then, but yours came out and yours was bigger than like anybody else's. Yours was like oversized or something. It's like, hey, hey, wait a minute. How come Josh got to do this? Oh, I know. I think I even took some stuff out of it. I just, uh, yeah, he was really nice. I think it was like 52 pages. Yeah. And then, yeah. And though it was Raw Power 2 that I took a bunch of pages out of. And yeah, looking back, like everybody started to, that started to snowball where people started doing longer and longer pieces. Yeah. Yeah, but, that was such a cool thing that was like, okay, I'm going to start a Kickstarter to publish like one new comic every month from a different artist in alternative comics. Um, uh, I'm going to get a bunch of shops to agree to carry them. So you had distribution. Yeah. And uh, and then like you sign up and you get it delivered to your mailbox or whatever. And like every month you'll get a new comic. from. I mean, that's an awesome idea. Yeah. It was a yeah. really cool thing, you know? Um, and it's there were more anthologies back then. I feel like too, like it was like a really. It just feel. I just felt like everybody had like an anthology to, for you to try and do something for, and that was really good for getting your name out too within the scene. I feel like there's a lot of anthologies right now. Yeah, but I'm not invited to any of them anymore. <laughs> back then, it was like I was always getting the invite. And I don't get any invites anymore. I don't either, actually. And um, yeah, I was just talking about that with a friend of mine. And uh, yeah, it's it is. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I uh, actually I got invited to one anthology. There's a guy who wants to put out an anthology of all Josh's. It's like it's it's all it's gonna be called Josh, and that's actually the one I have to do that '90s comic for. Cool. Uh, but it's funny. It's like I need those con. It's a it's a nice shot in the arm to be invited to anything. I really like having like several things going on because otherwise you're left like kind of clinging to this one rock that kind of makes you feel legitimate and yeah. it's like you know fortunately um fortunately um i've got a i've got a lot of nice developments happening right now but i've had like periods where i have that one rock to cling to and you can easily see how even that rock can disappear and you see people who are in that position where the kind of they they're a little bit they drifted they're not doing what it's been a couple of years since they did work they wonder if people remember them mm -hmm. it can be a, it can be a struggle i i try i try to see everything as being kind of glass half full i feel like that might be that might make you might be humbling in a good way mm -hmm. yeah i think having a deadline is like one of the best thing where somebody invites you and i just need something by this date and they leave it open for you like or actually but you know also if they have like a theme like when you were doing Suspect Device, like that was really a fun, man, that was fucking hilarious. Those comics were so funny, dude. Thank um, you. But it was just like, you know, here, here is like what you have to work with. Like you send like an envelope of just random comic panels and like one is a, it's a, how it starts and one's how it ends and you have to fill in the middle. Um, man, that was so, that was a blast. The podcaster, Sarah Miller, she said that um um she does that comic you're wrong that i mean that podcast you're wrong about mm -hmm. and she said that feeling when you're into a project and you are obsessed with it and you're locked in mm -hmm. she's like like whether it's good it turns into anything that's a really precious thing some people never have that in life oh wow yeah i tell that to a lot of students it's, yeah. and it puts things in perspective too who knows what's going to happen with this thing that you're doing but right now you've tapped into something that a lot that is for me, it makes you feel, it makes me feel like that's what, that's one of the crucial experiences I'm supposed to be here on earth to have. Yeah. The problem solving part of it is like, um, a big, uh, thing that keeps me 
going too is like i know i have to get this character from point a to point b right and then like figuring out how to get them there mm -hmm. uh, and like what hurdles to put in their way and like what those hurdles are going to represent to help build who the character is and things like that and it's like what you said about ms harkness how you know the make your main character like the villain or something like that like, <laughs> i feel like i do that all the time like my, i always make my main characters like the most hateable people and you i'm like defying the reader to like them like um do you think that you have uh like graphomania by the way yeah probably but you know i'm just stubborn especially about something that i love so much but like i said i think that i've um yeah and i've always had a weird relationship with organization of any of any um, type. I was talking to a student actually, who was telling me um, that she, I was asking, she has ADD and so do I. And she said, well, you know, um, she's like, yeah, my ADD. And she started referring to object permanence. And I was like, oh, what's that about? I remember taking psychology courses where they talk about object permanence has to do with like, do you know that term? Yeah, just from um, having a baby. They, that's a big developmental stage object. Oh, permanence. wow. Yeah. So she, I had never heard this twist on it. She goes, yeah, your, your sense of objects, your sense of an object will be there after you put it aside is tied into her ADD. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. She goes, yeah, I have stacks in my house. I'm like, so do I. I'm like, I'll get, I bought a new desk with the hopes of organizing and I end up my books and my papers stacked on it and my bottles of ink and then i'm drawing like here in front of the desk with like at an angle like on my lap yeah and, she, and i'm like oh that's a really interesting i feel like that's um it's it's an emotional thing it's like i have a weird there's a sense that the thing is not going to be there unless you keep it around all the time so if i clean up it can really screw up my system my systems and so that yeah there's that and i think it's that's funny because it's a different type of mania mm -hmm. or a different type of uh so i definitely have i think a, a little bit of column a a little bit of column b a little bit of something i haven't analyzed yet which is fine but like i said i've also been um streamlining it a little bit recently the newest project i'm doing the steps more in order and i feel like i'm finally cinching getting into some little nooks and crannies and corners that i've been avoiding um, let me let me show you something and ask if, if you think that you would be capable of doing something like this or if you if it would just drive you crazy to work this simple. Do you see this? Yeah. Could you do something like that? I do not think so. What would you do? Add the bricks? Do you think you would do each individual brick on that wall? Yeah, I would probably do. Um, yeah, I, I might do a fade out. I might do the bricks like really hairy at the top and hatch like you know ha do hatching until it came down to them and then maybe have like a clean cloud of you know empty space around them mm -hmm. yeah i'm you? the same way that's why that's i there's a few images by your swart that are like that for me where i'm just like i could never do that even though somebody who was not a cartoonist would look at that maybe and think like oh that's not you know that it doesn't look like he worked very hard on that or something they wouldn't get it I'd like to get to that point. Like one of the things I like about John Porcelino's work, for example, is that he's, he's worked out, you know, he's such a writer that even his images have become like an alphabet. Like he has an alphabet for everything that he needs. Like, this is how a tree looks. This is how like a person looks. you know, um, this is how a person's like three quarter profile looks or whatever. The ear is going to come outside of the panel sometimes. Um, and there's so much restraint that is needed to do that, but it takes a long time to get to that place you know it takes you, you you need to be you need to have like a calm mind or something i don't know um well you just the schwartz piece uh just i'm probably pronouncing it wrong uh reminds me a little bit of um mcmanus is bringing up father oh yeah uh-huh yeah i can see that i mean he's yeah he is like very consciously you know pastiching together old comics when he does that work it's European though. Like Europeans have their own style of working where a lot of times they don't even do panel borders. Like I've actually had like a Belgian artist tell me that that's like a very American thing to like has to be contained in these panel, you know, they're very free with it. Like the guy on the street, the woman on the street might look at that Swartz piece and say, well, that's, they're not even doing, 
they're not even completing the image. That's right. That's, that's easy. And part of me, of course, and there's all kinds of respects that I hate that. I hate the attitude. A lot of them think like there's a trick to making art too, mm -hmm. but they, they, um, they, uh, I think part of part of me is like when I try to make my work really hairy, I'm like, I got to give people something to look at to show I haven't lost like my tether to reality, whatever that means. And so there's a right. little, but at the same time, if I really believe that I never would have done such a long book, you know, about ideas and dreams and flights of, you know, flight, uh, all those um, uh, tangents that my book goes on. Yeah, it would be interesting. I mean, but the, the thing is like, it's you get turned on about about creating this object of like it's a pamphlet with staples and you open it it's just packed with line work you know like that that in itself is like a motivation to work like that you're like yeah but that's what i have in my mind like I, it has to be this thing that's so full you know that somebody's gonna buy for five dollars and they're gonna get like a lot of value from it <laughs> right i'd like to see you do like uh just like solid black backgrounds like your characters like in front of you know, like that old Harvey P. Carr style where it's the character talking to you with just a black background, you know? The old man, I don't know. Yeah, I have a weird... Um, could you I do saw... that? Or would that drive you nuts? No, I could do it. I just... It, it would... I, it's the same thing. It's like it feels like too easy, but that's not... It's not it. But it's really... I think my... I mentioned before that line weight is a th something I have a hard time getting my... My, getting a good handle on that I wrestle with and so are spotting blacks I yeah. end up being basically happy with where I'm going with my blacks but it is um when I look at all the people whose work I love who are really juggling around the blacks and taking chances with them um when I look at like um when I look at uh, uh Kniff especially I'm like not only is he doing these really large blacks, but he's doing complex blacks and it's all readable. And even if somebody has like a strap, like a, a canteen on a strap around their chest, if you look carefully, there's little dab blacks along the canvas, the leather strap. Yeah. So it's like he has this instinct for kind of getting in there to the nooks and crannies and creating dimension. Mm -hmm. And then he also knows not where to do that. It's like the next page, the guy might have that canteen strap and it's kind of part of a network of like inner, like a, a, a sort of a spider web of lines going to wrinkle their shirt. And that's great too. So it's like, it's one of the things that, uh, yes, one of those things that I can feel very mixed up about. And I'm always trying to like force it in. I actually, going back to what you said, I could actually see myself doing an all contour line comic, not as minimal as he did. I'd probably lean into the wrinkles and doing kind of like, I could see myself doing something like Dave Cooper does. Oh yeah. Where it's like half the lines are smooth and half the lines are, are like nervous and wiggly. And then he ends up getting into like little grooves. That's just as sculptural as mm -hmm. anything else that you could look for. Do you like uh, like H.T. Webster or like Claire Briggs? Do you go back that far? I don't, not by name. Who were they? They were cartoonists like in the 1920s. I think Claire Briggs was like at one time, like one of the most popular cartoonists in, in America. And he died in like 1930. So oh, he's the guy that you did that, that you reproduced his work in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm, I love his work so much because it's very, he was so popular, but he was like, you know, H.T. Webster was like really good. Like his work was like really tight. But Claire Briggs was looser, uh, and I relate to his work more. Like I, I look at his drawing a lot and try and kind of copy what he did. This is like one of his right here um, that I like a lot, and like the way that he has the the black brush strokes in the background, yes, is like amazing. Like it's just so chunky, and it just seems so expressive. And this is nineteen, I think nineteen seventeen or nineteen nineteen or something. It's really great, and uh, I just think, man, that's amazing, and just the way. Like how loose his drawing actually was, how sketchy it was. Uh, it just seems that like way ahead of its time, you know, um, because I don't know, like a lot of these guys adjusted their style. Like they would come from like Puck or something, you know, where they were doing these like full illustration style. Like, I don't know if you ever seen Frederick Opper, like how his work changed from like when he was in Puck to when he became like an editorial cartoonist and how loose he got once he was able to do that. I'm trying that to remember. Person. I know his name really well. But I'm sure, did he have a strip that he's associated with, or he just was the editor? Opera, yeah, he did a uh, uh, Happy Hooligan. 
Oh, I love Happy Hogan. Yeah, yeah. Low Kano. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like his, you know, that's like kind of loose and cartoony and stuff. Like he was, but if you look at the work he was doing before that, he was doing those like full page spreads for Puck where they were like very tight. Uh, yeah. And, but he, but those guys were like inventing comics at the time, you know? So like they were deciding like what was funny, like what made like an image funny. And I think that what they were coming to, the conclusion they were coming to was that looser was funnier, you know, like, <laughs> like, uh, and I think I carried that over. Like when I do funny work, like I want it to be loose because I think that like the immediacy of the image sh should match the immediacy of somebody telling you a joke, you know, like it should just be like really quick and crappy looking. And then th that's funny. Simon Hanselman's work when he would do like, just those like really fast kind of sketchbook stuff. Yeah. Really great. Yeah, I'm trying to, that's a really good point. I mean, Klaus's stuff, but I mean, there's humor in his serious work too. Yeah. And and that has an extra creepy quality to it because it's so carefully done. But they were invent when they were inventing it though, they it's like they came to that conclusion, like, you know, cartooning, like what is cartooning? Like it, it if you're trying to make somebody laugh, like it has to be sort of like a the line has to look fast you know like it was just like thrown at you or something 